Welcome to our most recent Diverse Brains event. Uh, it's great to see uh, people here, uh, particularly uh, those with Y chromosomes. Uh, it's, uh, I called it man shaming uh, to get people uh, of all types uh, here uh, to this event. So the goal of Diverse Brains, and we're now in our third year, is to ensure that everyone who comes to Mount Sinai has a truly equal opportunity. And I think a critical part of that is for each of us to understand that each of us have a different experience as we go from being a student, graduate student, postdoc, onto the faculty, and then through the faculty ranks. And it took me longer than it perhaps should to realize that my background as a, you've heard me say this before, white, male, Jewish, New Yorker, uh, wasn't hard for me to find role models, uh, wasn't hard for me to feel that I belonged. Uh, and I've learned that other people have not had that same positive experience. And it's, so it's essential that we pay attention to this, all of us, if we're going to uh, truly achieve the goal of establishing equal opportunity for all. So with that, it gives us just tremendous pleasure uh, to uh, have one of our own faculty, Denise Kai, uh, join us to tell us about her experience. Uh, I think most of you know Denise. Uh, she uh, joined us just about a year ago from UCLA. She's a rising superstar in the field of cognitive neuroscience and look forward to hearing about what you have to say, Denise. Thank, Thank you for you. doing this. So um, thank you so much, Eric, for this initiative and for inviting me to be here. And really, thank you all for being here. This is actually incredible. I'm actually going to try to keep my talk a little short so that we have plenty of time for discussion. And I hope that we're going to be able to engage in a dialogue. And what we really do today is not answer all of these questions, but that to continue the conversation that is already going on that is really important. So the title of my talk is, Is It Really Harder to Be a Woman in, Neuros in Science? Um, and some of you guys giggle because, you know, you think the answer is obvious, and actually the answer isn't. And I've talked to many um, different women um, in neuroscience, and some say, no, actually, I haven't quite seen um, what is so obviously difficult about being a woman in science, while others have, and I completely want to validate everyone's experiences. And today I'm just going to share my own personal experience. And um, as scientists, we all know large sample sizes are really important to generalize results. And as an N of one, I don't try to generalize my experience to yours. I don't try to generalize my approach to yours. Um, but I can just share with you how I went about um, pursuing uh, science. Um, and hopefully we can engage in a conversation about you know, your guys' approaches as well. So, I like to start at the end, well hopefully this is not the end, it's only the beginning of my career, but where I'm at now. And people tell me all the time, Denise, you're so lucky. And they're right. Um, I like to think of my life, just to put things in perspective, as an ice cream sundae. The foundation of my life as an ice cream sundae really is uh, my hero in life, and that is my husband, who's also faculty here, Tristan Schumann. And he is the vanilla ice cream of my sundae. And just <laughs> Ice cream alone is fantastic, right? I could eat ice cream all day. But on top of that, I am the mother of these two rambunctious, uh, conniving, fun uh, kids. And they're like the hot fudge that gets into the nooks and cranny of every part of that Sunday, right? And that would have been enough. Like, that's a pretty good Sunday if I just had ice cream and hot fudge. But on top of that, I have my dream job, you guys. So I had the best job in the world. So I, um, as Eric said, just became an assistant professor here in the Department of Neuroscience. And I get paid to make discoveries about the brain. Actually, not me, but my team. And that together, um, we get the privilege of peering inside the brain and looking at how the brain codes information and how we remember conversations like we're having today and how do we recall that in the future and, and aggregate memories across a lifetime. So that is like 
my cherry on top of a freaking fantastic Sunday. So you're right, my life is really uh, great. Um, and I've had comments, so the title actually came from a question where someone said to me, Denise, you have it all. Is it really harder to be a woman in science? And I was so flabbergasted by that question, and I realized, wow, we need to have more of a conversation, because my life was an all ice cream sundaes, um, and there were some hardships that um, I experienced, and today I will share with you some of those questions, or some of those hardships. So today I'm gonna to try to answer, um, give you some glimpses of how I face harassment and bias, specifically uh, sexual harassment and implicit bias. How do I balance family and career, or if there's actually such a thing as balance um, in family and career? And then how do I embrace imposter syndrome? Okay, so starting with, um, uh, this is kind of my motto for approaching all of life, and um, it's taken by this African proverb, popularized by Hillary Clinton, um, and it's, the phrase is, it takes a village. And I'm gonna take slight adaptation to that and say, well, life is hard. It takes an army and get ready for the battle, okay? So this is gonna kind of be my general theme throughout my talk. So the first question about harassment and bias. So I went to UCSD um, for grad school and it was the best time of my life. So I didn't have any expectations as a grad student. You're not expected to know things, right? But you could to like try and learn and figure things out. And in addition to doing some science, uh, we also went paragliding um, because we were right along the coast. I learned to play a lot of intramural sports. We drank a lot of good single uh, malts and we had lots of fantastic um, dinner parties. And also I met the man of my dreams. Here is uh, Dr. Tristan Schumann, faculty here at in Neuroscience. And here us living carefree because the world is at our fingertips. And really, my grad school experience could not have been better, except that there were some instances where I was made to feel really uncomfortable. And I didn't even know at the time that that was not an okay thing, um, but I learned. And as I learned, um, uh, I will share with you one example. Uh, there was a faculty member who was very senior, and it was uh, well known, he had a reputation of kind of being a sexual predator, to be honest. And I was supposed to TA for this professor, and you know, I'm not that shy, as you probably noticed, and I said very politely, I said, please don't harass me in these three very specific ways. Please do not mention um, my body parts in front of the class of 200, 300 students. Please do not speak about my sexual preferences or my sexual history. Okay, so not that any of those things are particularly interesting, and he laughed, and then he did it anyway. So in front of two, 300 undergraduate students, he showed a picture of two aplesia, and he said, oh, this is like um, you know, our TA, Denise, and this other TA having lesbian sex. Imagine, da 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 da, and I thought that was inappropriate. And this was one of the more minor comments that were mentioned in front of the students, and then the whole, all, everyone in the auditorium laughed because he laughed, and everyone thought this was a really funny joke. Um, he also kept asking me out um, to have dinner for a said restaurant, then at his house. I always kindly said, No, thank you. Um, and Eventually, I was asked actually to write a letter of recommendation for him because he was nominated for this Distinguished Teaching and Excellence Award at our university. And I, along with other students that had worked with this professor, decided, well, we're gonna write a letter, but we're just gonna be truthful, and we're just gonna say what happened, and we asked that this letter be passed on to leadership. And it was confirmed that it was, and then the next thing we heard, he won the teaching award. We never heard back from our complaint. And I thought, why did I risk my puny reputation? Why did I go try to make change? Because what's the point? So um, some people, through these kinds of actions, actually dropped out of grad school. I was very lucky. I stayed, and I got my PhD. And I went on. And it wasn't until I was a postdoc at UCLA, I got a phone call, and they said, hey, Denise, remember that complaint you filed? Well, there's been several other complaints now, and now we're looking into it. We want to hear your side of the story. This has actually been going on for a long time, and we couldn't tell you at the time. And change took many voices. Change took a support, the support of lots of people, and change um, you know, really kind of took a 
army of people to, to go and make this happen. And this was you know, almost maybe a decade ago. And I think that change now is happening much more rapidly. And I've spoken to the leadership here at Sinai, and they've assured me that change happens very quickly here. And what I want to advise you, if anyone makes you feel uncomfortable and you're not sure, is this harassment? Is this a compliment? Is this what? Go talk to someone that you trust. Who is in your corner? Who is in your army that you trust? Um, so build your army. So there's explicit um, kind of offenses. But what I spend most of my time struggling as a young scientist is the implicit um, biases. And um, for example, I was at a postdoc interview. So I was a third year graduate student. And this is someone that I admired for a long time. And I was so excited at the opportunity of potentially joining his lab. And he said to me, you know what, Denise, at the end of the interview, he said, you're hired. He's like, but you're going to get lots of offers because he said, you're smart and you're easy on the eyes. And at the time, I thought, oh, thank you. Uh, this must be a compliment. Um, but these kinds of comments shatter a young person's confidence. Because all we want as young people is to be taken seriously. We have the biggest imposter syndrome, right? And, and I was a third year graduate student. Just you know, objectively, I published 11 papers, four of them first authors. That alone should have been enough to get hired as a postdoc. But then I had a question like, oh, I guess to be a scientist, should I be more feminine? Should I be more masculine? Am I being too pretty, not pretty enough? And, and it caused this internal struggle that I've been struggling with ever since, and, and I will talk later in the talk how I'm finding my confidence. But you know, the things that have been said to me across the last few years since I was a grad student is, don't be so cute when you give a talk. You're, you're not going to be taken seriously. Or you're way too bubbly. Or you, know, you lack confidence, and if they smell the lack of confidence, no one's going to want to hire you. Or stop being too apologetic. But in the same vein, and sometimes by the same people, I've been told I'm overly confident, and I'm mouthy, and someone even once called me a nasty woman. <laughs> but if I'm put in the category of other people that are called nasty women recently, maybe that's OK. right? <laughs> um, and so I heard this great quote recently uh, from Jess Carr. Now, it was a women's luncheon at uh, this computational neuroscience conference. And this is actually from the internet. Um, and she said, when in doubt, <laughs> carry yourself with the confidence of a mediocre white man. You don't have to even carry yourself as Eric Nessler, OK? Just pick your mediocre Jewish white male in New York. Have that confidence, right? And I will talk later on about how I developed my confidence and where I figured out that line is. But something we as women struggle with is we're always too confident, we're always too underconfident, all at the same time. We're too mouthy, we're too forward, we're not assertive, we don't lean in, we lean, lean in too much, and it's, it's difficult. So when in doubt, as you're trying to find yourself, this is the default, and, as, and then you can always adjust up or down, right? OK. So the second question is, how do I balance family and career? So when I was a graduate student, I used to go to these um, luncheons to talk to faculty about what is their life as a scientist or professor or whatever. And essentially what I was told over and over again is that you cannot have family and a career. So I thought, OK, these are the experts. So I chose to have a career instead. And um, when Tristan and I were getting more serious, I said, hey, like, you just have to kind of know I might not want to have kids. And after a while, he's like, OK. And then, you know, life doesn't always come the way you expect. <laughs> and literally, um, I found out while we were in the lab, because I was feeling sick, and I was like, this is weird. And while he's on the vibratome slicing brains, I chucked this pregnancy test at him and <laughs> thinking, my life is over. My career is over. Why did I work so hard? Um, and I went into um, my postdoc advisor's office one day, Alcino Silva, and I said, Alcino, I'm so sorry for getting pregnant. And my career is over, I know. And he said to me, you're crazy. Uh, he said, it's, he said, first, this is great news. It's going to be great. You're going to be fine. And we're going to do this together. And he was actually someone that championed um, me in, in, in finding my balance between family and um, career. And so, um, well, 
I had Caden. And despite that you see me smiling in this picture, most of that first year, I felt like this. <laughs> and it was something I've never experienced. I didn't quite experience like that joy and that instant bond, like that didn't happen for me. Instead, I experienced a lot of pain and dread and darkness. Um, so some people call it baby blues. For me, it was kind of like baby pitch blackness. Um, and it was a really dark time um, in my life. And I remember there was one time when I called Tristan, I said, Tristan, it is so hard. The pain is so deep that I just want to cease to exist. And somehow, um, I had this amazing supportive husband. I had friends who are like, anytime you have a bad thought, you text me. You say it out loud so that we walk with you through this process. I talked to my advisor about it, and he knew, and I had this incredible team of people that I will show you in a bit that really helped me through this tough time. And I was really lucky because my postpartum depression was transient. And for those of you who are struggling through whatever it is, anxiety, depression, fear, I see you, and I feel you, and you're not alone. Find your army of people that you can reach out to. So I was really lucky. My postpartum depression lasts about nine months to a year. And at Caden's first birthday, I started to feel somewhat normal, except that um, then I got pregnant again uh, <laughs> at nine months. As soon as I was feeling better, boom, knocked up. Um, <laughs> but so here is my second child, Clarity, wearing a Clarity bib. And yes, Tristan and I are so nerdy that we named our daughter Clarity after the brain clarification method developed by Dice Ross Lab. <laughs> And even though I had all this knowledge of, okay, you know, I'm going to be sad, it's gonna be hard, I still felt mostly like this most of that nine months. The way Clarity felt when her Easter cupcakes just toppled to the floor. Oops, mommy forgot to tell her, don't push the cupcakes onto the floor. And so <laughs> this kind of represents my life that first year after Clarity, and I remember being at the rig, doing surgeries, and it's a four hour surgeries, and I'm just crying because every other hour I had to, I had to have a student just um, uh, apply um, ACSF on the brain so the brain doesn't dry. My four hour surgery turned into nine hour surgery because every other hour I had to go pump to produce food for my child. And I was like, okay, this is not sustainable. I'm kind of going crazy. Um, and I think to my two like perfect children, and I thought, what am I doing here? Why am I at work? When I'm at work, I'm constantly feeling guilty about not being a good mom and not being with my children. And then when I'm with my children, I'm so guilty about not doing my work and wasting all these opportunities and resources I have to advance my career. And then I had a conversation with Clarity one day. Um, and I asked Clarity, I said, Clarity, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she said, I want to be a scientist. And I thought, oh God. <laughs> But, okay, she wants to be a scientist. And then she's like, actually, I want to be a mommy. And I said, Clarity, did you know you can be a mommy and a scientist? And she's like, I want to be a mommy and a scientist. And she was so excited. And as I said that, I realized, oh my gosh, I can be a mommy and a scientist. And I made that decision, and it was a conscious decision that each day I woke up, and I was gonna choose not to be guilty when I was at work. And the time that I was at work, here I am, I can show my daughter and son how to pursue my dreams hard, intensely, prioritizing what needs to be done so that I can get out of there when I needed to, to get home to my kids. And when I'm home with my, my kids and my husband, I try my best to turn my phone off, and I don't check emails as much, and I try to really focus on my kids and not worry about the stress at work. Going back to my ice cream sundae, it's already pretty great when I'm at home, so I don't need to think about work. And every day, making this conscious decision to choose work when I'm at work and to choose my family when I'm at home helps me to shed that guilt. And eventually, it's kind of like a habit that it kind of starts to become more natural to be at work and to enjoy being at work. And it's okay to enjoy being at work. And then being at home with kids and, being, um, and enjoying them as well. And I clearly did not do this alone. Um, as a postdoc, um, many of you postdocs out there know, so we work eight to 12 hour days. 
um, typically. And I really relied a lot on this handsome young man, Tristan, my husband. And we're really 25%, 25%. Um, and I say we're not quite 50-50 because we have a whole group of people that fill that slice of the pie, um, which includes, these are my best friends from eighth grade that uh, when I was in LA, we were, these are the people that I called when I didn't know what to do. Like, how do I, how do I potty train? How do I sleep train? There's so many trainings I don't know how to do. And, um, and they would hold my hand and be like, it's okay. It's okay. Um, and they were kind of the people that I went to in my time of need. In addition, so working eight to 12 hour days at work, um, who watches the kids and on a postdoc salary, which is like this much? And so thank goodness my parents were generous enough to take our kids. Basically, they said Monday through Friday, we, we moved across the street from my parents so they could take care of our kids. And they said Monday through Friday, we got them. Saturday, Sunday, yeah, you could play with your kids. So that's kind of <laughs> what we did, and that's what we had to do with no regrets. So coming to New York, we don't have these people. What are we doing? So somehow we convinced my best friend from third grade, Donna, who I think is here today. Now, she doesn't like her picture being showed, so this is just a blank silhouette. Um, but really, when I say Tristan and I do 25% each, and 50% is really Donna, she gets the kids up in the morning, brushes their teeth, gets them to school, picks them up from school, does homework with them, gets them to eat their vegetables, bathe brush their teeth, all that good stuff, and then we get to come home, put them to bed, read them a bedtime story, and be good parents, right? And then, in addition, Tristan and I travel a lot, way more than we want, so we need extra backup, and so we have family in Brooklyn that will come and help on the weekends when we're traveling. And so, Tristan and I don't do it alone. We have this entire army, no matter where we go, whether California or here, to support us in finding that balance um, between family and career, and also so we can have a date night every once in a while. I know, I owe him that. Okay, that will happen one day, I promise. <laughs> so lastly, the question is, how do I embrace imposter syndrome? So, okay, you guys, I'm gonna tell you a secret. I'm the biggest imposter of all. Um, I was pre-law as an undergrad. I applied to law schools, decided I don't actually want to be a lawyer, no offense to lawyers. Um, instead, I really wanted to do research, and so I um, entered into a psychology program where I studied human psychology. And entering into my postdoc, I had never even looked in a brain before. Okay, you know, this is like my job now. And I was being hired um, into Alcino's lab to study how we create memories and link them across time and separate them and such. And I didn't have any background in the brain, um, but I was super lucky to be in this fantastic lab with the nicest people, and I didn't have to pretend I didn't know anything. Everyone already knew I didn't know anything. The joke was always like, oh, there's Denise, a little psychologist trying to study the brain. And so I just asked them, like, um, what, what's CREB? What's a signaling pathway? Um, and so then they taught me, this is how you do a Western, this is how you do immunohistochemistry, and then I thought, wow, that's cool. So we understand how these molecules work together to form memories, but wouldn't it be so great then if you can use those molecules to actually, you know, um, to, to affect certain ensembles and then to activate those cells and manipulate those cells and cause it to drive behavior. So at the time, this is, you know, about eight years ago now, optogenetics wasn't that in vogue. And so um, Thomas and Balaj in the lab said, okay, psychologist, we will teach you all the optics and engineering behind this and how to you know, align mirrors and such and build this optogenetic system. It was kind of harder back in the days. And so we were able to do that together. And um, on top of that, it wasn't enough just to manipulate um, neural activity. We want to observe it for long periods of time. Right? We want to record the neural activity across the animal's lifetime. And that technology um, was something that we, inspired by technology developed at Stanford, had it developed at UCLA, and I sure as heck don't have experience doing that. So in collaboration with Daniel Haroni, who's a physicist, he kind of developed it, and then Tristan and I tested it out, and we got to do our science. And so I really didn't know much when I started, but I was surrounded by people who knew a whole lot of things I didn't know. And so, what, um, my, what I always tell people and what I tell my trainees is capitalize on your strengths. You don't have to be the best at everything. You're probably great at something, right? For me, it's Google Calendaring. Uh, I know how to <laughs> organize the you know, wazoo and, and maximize experimental schedules such that everyone could run all these experiments for our paper. Um, 
The important thing to know, and I, what I learned over the years, is know what you don't know, right? So whatever it is that you don't know, that is an opportunity to work with someone. And that's really the best part of science. And so um, this picture was actually taken the day that our paper got accepted into Nature. And Alcino said, hey, Denise, congrats. Your paper got in. Why don't we have a dinner? Call up your collaborators. We'll go out to dinner. So these are my collaborators. Um, there were 21 authors on that paper. Okay, um, Yeah, army, like serious army. Um, in that paper was four co-first authors. This was uh, Justin. I also didn't tell you when I was a postdoc, I had a medical condition well, for a long period of my life. I had a medical condition where about three or four times a year, I would randomly end up in the hospital. And Justin's job was to be on call at any time of day that he would get a text message from me and say, hey, I'm in the hospital. And he'd say, no problem. I have your lab notebook. I'm going to finish your experiment because science cannot stop. We progress. And if Justin wasn't able to do it, he found other people in lab to carry out the experiments so that um, we could continue science uh, with my mental, um, not mental, but health issues. Um, and then uh, Tristan also uh, helped me figure out how to use a tech tag system back in the day. This was, now everyone uses it, but in the day we didn't quite know how to use it. And then Daniel, who is a physicist who developed all this imaging technology that Tristan and I then troubleshoot and we worked together to develop it. And so all I did was kind of, okay, can you help me? You're great, can you help me? You are amazing, can you help me? And together, we did something really special. So this project would not have happened um, without the support. So it was 21 authors. This happened across five different labs in three different campuses with four first authors and two co-corresponding authors. And so as you can tell, I'm a fan of collaboration. Um, I'm all about building my army. So, oh, okay, so the question is now here <laughs> at Sinai, right? I, I, I constantly, my army has to evolve as I move on to different stages in life. And here, where is my army? So, you know, Tristan and I have been following um, the science of Eric Nessler, um, who you guys all know, um, who's the dean here, and uh, Paul Kenny, who's the chair of neuroscience for a long time. But it was when we met them that we recognized, well, they're not just great scientists, they're visionary leaders, and they're amazing mentors, and just overall really nice people. And so, you know, my army here begins with the leadership, which we just fully trust them um, with our careers. Um, that's Eric Nesser and Paul Kenny, who's my chair. Um, in addition, I have amazing uh, mentors, both official and unofficial. Uh, here's Scott Russo, um, Paul Sessinger, and Yasmin Hurd. And they give me advice about how to start a lab, things to be careful about, how do I hire people, what experiments I should be running first in my lab. And as I said before, you know, I'm the biggest imposter at all. I know how to do kind of one thing, and really it's not even me, it's my team, like they're experts in, in this thing that, um, in which what we're great at is being able to record lots of neural activity simultaneously, track that cell activity across long periods of time, and see how that encodes behavior and how that contributes to behavior. But in addition, I mean, we really wanna know where we think these changes happen is in the molecule inside the cell but I'm not a molecular biologist. Um, and so we team up with Ian Mays to understand in this population of cells and code of the memory compared to neighboring neurons, what are the molecular differences? What are the signaling challenge or changes in those cells are different than the nearby cells? And then in collaboration with Roger Klein, we can ask, well, we know there are molecular changes in these cells, but how does that drive intrinsic changes in the cell, right? So going from molecular to cellular and asking, in these cells that encode the memory, how does that affect um, excitability, for example, if the cells are more likely to fire or less likely to fire than neighboring neurons? And then, then what we do in my lab is look at circuit level changes and together with not just one neuron or two neurons, but lots of neurons together and how this coordinated activity um, leads to behavioral outcome. 
But in addition to um, imaging and observing um, uh, naturalistic you know, uh, brain activity, we also want to be able to manipulate or be able to do lots of variations of that. And so in collaboration with Tristan Schumann and Daniel Aharoni, we can develop new imaging technologies, um, which we're already doing so that we can both visualize and perturb the brain at the same time. And we're also developing imaging technology with Paul Sessinger to um, look at in vivo neuromodulation, um, as well as as um, uh, Mark Baxter. And then we have you know, 40 terabytes of data and thousands of neural activity, of course, simultaneously. How do you make sense of it all? I've never taken a math class after high school, OK? So um, I don't have enough experience to understand how all of these uh, properties work together to form theoretical models that unify computations in the brain. And so I go to Kanaka Rajan, who's a new faculty here in neuroscience, uh, expert in computational neuroscientist, and um, we're trying to work together, uh, really her and my grad student together, are uh, <laughs> figuring out unifying theories about how the hippocampus computes for um, information. And um, Mark Baxter also does not like his picture being shown. Um, but Mark Baxter and I are also working well. Going from rodents, can we translate any of these results um, in, in doing imaging in non-human primates? Um, and then to really scale it up, the dream, you guys, the dream in my lab at least, is that what we're doing in mice and in, in these kind of um, uh, in these rodent studies can be translated to understand human memory and then to also treat human disease. And so um, the, the paper that we recently published, now we have some of the behavioral replications in humans, and along with Daniela Schiller, what we want to do is try to design parallel types of experiments so we can ask questions on rodents and humans and bridge complementary imaging techniques between calcium imaging and fMRI. And so I know this much, but I don't have to know it all, because these people know it all. And I can tap into the brilliance and the resources. And at the end of the day, this is the best part of my job. It's the people. And really, it's not even these people. It's not even these people or these people that do the work, right? The reason that this is the best job, this is my dream job, is because of these people. So this is my team. We together work on hard problems. And they are so inspirational to me. Um, they work harder than I actually want them to, um, but I don't try to, you know, ask them to stop working. Um, <laughs> and they are generous, and they're kind, and they're smart, and they're creative. And so I get to be surrounded by an amazing army here. And um, lastly, and certainly not least, um, it's really important to have great mentors along the way. And I certainly continually rely on my past mentors. So as I already mentioned, Elsina Silva, who is my postdoc advisor, Pema Goshani, who was um, one of my mentors uh, while I was a postdoc, and uh, Sarah Mednick, who was one of my PhD advisors. I mean, these are people that I still rely on um, to this day as I'm trying to figure out my path. So, OK, so hopefully um, I've at least given you a little bit of taste of how I go about answering these questions. And the answer for me is, it takes an army. So build yours. So who's in your corner? Who's in your army? So at this point, is Chris here? OK, so um, people from my lab are going to pass out something to you. And I have a gift for each of you. Yes, we have a gift for each of them. OK. <laughs> so when I was 21, um, we were celebrating a birthday party at Club Miyagi's. Some of you guys may have heard it. This may be outdated. So back in the club, my very smart friend, who's now a neonatologist, she said, Denise, everyone is special. You just got to go figure out what's special in each of them. That w was not the best advice at the club. But <laughs> what I'm telling you guys today is that all of you guys are special. You all have strengths. So figure out what it is that's strong in you. Capitalize on that. And then know what it is your weakness and celebrate the weakness and compliment your weakness. So uh, are, we, are we passing things out? Yeah, OK, now is the time. Thank you. So we're going to give you guys each a rose to take with you, because I want you to remember your strengths, celebrate yourself, um, and take care of yourself. So um, with that, I'm very happy to take questions, and I think we have some time. So um, any
any questions? And here, I'm gonna open it up, okay? Like, I've, I've shared some really personal things, so no limit. You can ask me whatever you want. I don't have to answer, but you can ask me whatever you want. Yes? Oh, sorry. We have, um, so this is being broadcasted, so if you don't mind speaking to Mike so everyone can hear your questions. And I think, if there, uh, Veronica tells me there's people that joined us through the Go meeting. If you guys have questions, I don't know how to, uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Really wonderful talk and very inspirational. Thank you so much for being honest and brave for being up there. Thanks. That's phenomenal. Um, I find especially the, the motherhood part, I think a lot of women feel this way. Like you hadn't necessarily planned it, but people who would like to, and if, they're, if their army isn't around and they are trying to plan for those yes. sort of things, what would be your recommendation trying to find those resources and trying to find, build that community? Yes. To, what, how would you recommend going about that? That's a fantastic question. So um, I think one is to, so if you are working, then you have to figure out how that can work with your, um, with your work situation. So what I actually didn't show, so one of the most popular Twitter pictures I reposted was my son underneath my desk. He, um, and I have to be honest, um, my kids, there's been more sick days and storm days and snow days than I ever could have imagined. And while we have an army, they still come to work with us. And um, you know, when I was a postdoc, my advisor also babysat for me. Um, my, my undergraduate students, while I was fear conditioning mice, they would roll my son around UCLA campus to keep him company. I mean, like, whatever it took, um, and to most importantly not feel guilty about it. So there should be resources here. Um, so if there are people that are planning to have family, um, I would say, you know, talk to people that have, um, have gone that route here um, and that they may have advice. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Yeah, please. Thanks. Just to add on, for me, yeah. a, an amazing thing in my life is to find a caregiver who can be there if the school is closed, if it snows, if the child is sick. So for me, that was transformation of both my husband and I work. So it, that's made our lives um, much, much, much easier, and professionally, and to enjoy our times with our kids, and, 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 and the relationship between husband and wife as well. Yeah, so I'm actually gonna put Eric on the spot to answer this question, because I've always wondered, uh, no pressure, Eric, if there is um, here at Sinai kind of an emergency care if school is out or kids are sick, Sandy. That's such a good introduction to me. <laughs> so uh, I'm Sandy Mazur, and I send a lot of emails to everybody about issues having to do with implicit bias and gender and all things like that. For the last few years, we have been working on bringing emergency backup daycare to Mount Sinai. We're almost there. What that will mean is that everybody who is in training or is on faculty will have 10 days of emergency backup care by vetted babysitters, et cetera, who can come to your house, and you will pay $6 an hour for those uh, 10 days. And we think that's a great start. What's wonderful about it is they also have this tremendous directory of people who've been vetted in all sorts of areas. And we're hoping that if this is successful, we'll be able to expand it so that at least the database will be available to everybody in the institution. It is terribly important when you talk about that day that you don't know how you're going to get in. You've got that experiment that's crucial, and you've got a sick kid. So, yes, it's an important thing, and we're about to do yeah. it. Thank you, Candy. Denise, I just wanted to say I've never cried during a <laughs> seminar before. So, first of all, thank you for being so honest and, and brave. And, and second, in terms of the question about childcare, again, my husband and I, we joke also that it takes a village. <laughs> But we pay ours. Yeah. We don't have anyone nearby, and, and villages can be bought. Yes. Uh. <laughs> yes. And if you're a postdoc or grad student, that villages are harder to buy, um, share, co op like co op each other, you know, and share nanny care and trade off days so that your family can go on a date night versus theirs. That's even what we do now because we only get paid so much. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? And it doesn't even have to be a question. If, yeah, Eric? So I have a question. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing 
the earlier experiences in your career where people behave badly with you. <laughs> it's just shocking for me to hear that people do that. I did not experience that. That's a classic example of the difference experience <laughs> that you and I had, for example. So I'm just out of curiosity. People mind raising their hands if they've experienced any bad behavior like that? Holy shit. <laughs> right, okay. Thank you. So what will, it, what will it take, what will it take to end it, right? You guys, what, what did it take? Uh, can someone pass her mic, please? Okay. Does anyone need? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh. Uh, she has her hand up. Um, I'm, I'm answering because something actually unfortunately happened here a couple months ago. And um, I think the first thing is to just be brave enough to not stand for it. Um, I think a, especially as a woman, you feel uh, like you don't want to start, you know, start anything or, you know, uh, cause any trouble. Um, but, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's about saying something um, until something is done about it. So if, 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 if saying it to the first person is not enough, then tell somebody else until it's taken care of because it's not okay. So I think that that in itself is something that um, a lot of people don't do. You know, like th they'll support somebody else doing it, but when it actually happens to you, it's so much easier to just either hold it in or to talk about it with your friends later, but in the moment not actually do something to, you know, punish or, you know, get rid of the problem, so. You know, so I just sit in my office all day long and count paper clips. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what's happening unless somebody tells me. Right. And I would love to know what happened and do something. But what I promise you guys, if I know something, something will happen. And we're going to hold him to yes. it because we have witnesses. Uh, saying this. It's broadcasted. Publicly. So I just wanted to say thank you, thank you for your ability to be vulnerable because I think it's very important that we can create spaces um, in our institution and, and I'm seeing that more and more in which we're able to create these environments where people can share their stories. Um, I just wanted to go back to the question you're asking about this idea of what can we do. I think you know, one thing that's sometimes a bit problematic is that we see what's going on in society, right? The Me Too movement is going on, right? And so the assumption has to be that things are going on in lots of different settings. I think one issue is that a lot of times, um, first of all, there, there are a few things that we can do, right? Because there's this idea that people need to be brave to speak up. But a lot of people are in particular positions where they don't have the power or the leverage. It's not even a matter of being brave. It's a matter of them not having um, the, the power to do so. And we could think about all of the intersectional identities that people have, right? And so even as we speak of, of women speaking up, we can think about even marginalized subpopulations of women who, who can't speak up, not just in our faculty, not just in our students, but among our staff especially. And I think they're probably even more vulnerable than we are yeah. as faculty, um, et cetera. But I think it also takes not just asking us who experience these things how to solve the problem. I think it has to be that we don't only react, but we create a culture in which this is just not acceptable, but that also will require having more of us in leadership positions where this is just unacceptable. And, and so I think I think we have to have a larger conversation. And I, I know that you will do something. The problem is this is systematic. Yeah. And so in order to make systematic changes, we have to change a culture. And that has to be proactive rather than reacting to, to problems. Yeah. Beautiful. I, I, I'm just going to add one other thing to that. I think the point beautifully made 
Um, we do have Title IX to support people. And I, one of the many hats I wear is I'm the Title IX coordinator. I don't know how many of you actually took the online training. <laughs> it's helpful. It not only identifies where the issues are, but how you can address them and the people to come to, to talk to. I'm going to be sending out a reminder because there are sort of a few people, and I think you can identify each of you, who have not taken that training yet. I think it's helpful. I think the fact that we have Eric Nessler in his position with his sensitivity and his activism is going to be essential. But also remember, we do have Title IX, so I want you to be working with me, especially to change our culture, because I think that's what's essential. A, a, an area, a community with mutual respect is the one in which the most creative research and teaching can be done. And if I can just comment, um, so I am also in that situation as well, right? So I am junior faculty, barely faculty, and I can actually only tell you the most mildest of stories today, because the other stories, if I told you, I might not, you know, um, it might affect me in grant reviews or as my paper gets reviewed or whatever. And so I get that. Um, I also don't want to always be the woman that, you know, makes a ruckus, right? So um, part of my, I'm very lucky, I married a white male who's faculty here. And so when sometimes I don't want to always be that female voice, I'm like, hey, white male, you speak up for us, right? Um, and, and this idea that, sorry, Tristan, to <laughs> put you on blast. It's okay, he married me, he, know what, he knows what he got himself into. Um, that, so find other people that if you can't speak for yourself or because there is that situation, find someone that can speak for you um, or speak with you, that can help you. <laughs> and maybe above average, not just mediocre white man, but above average white man to speak for you. Yeah. I, I think as all of us, we're very tremendously thankful for the leadership here, which is very different than other institutions for diversity for women, and which makes the institution quite unique for this. Um, I think my point I would like to make is, um, for me as a foreigner coming to this country, I was quite shocked to see the number of educated women who just do not work out of the workforce. And, and, um, and I came to understand that later on when I had children, um, a child, because um, the society demands that one, uh, people work 12, 14 hours a day, and how can you have two people doing that without, with the cost of caregiving in this country? Yeah. Um, so uh, um, so and for me, I've always had it deeply in my mind that every man and every woman has a, a right um, to pursue um, happiness in, in fulfillment, both in their personal lives and then in, in their career. And the, the problem is that things get so much split in which, so one works 14 hours a day, has professional career, has no time for the children, and the other stays at home, has all the time for the children, and gets very frustrated because they did not pursue their own ambitions and their own uh, fulfillments prof professionally. And I think as a society, and you look into different societies, I was in Copenhagen recently, how this, the society is just differently structured in a way that um, uh, people can balance, both of them can work and balance it out and, 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 and at the end the burden stays a lot on the, on the women. And so I think an issue that America as a society has to tackle, thinking about cultural, culturally, is how to, to be able to balance work and life in a way that is appropriate for both men and women to, to fulfill their personal lives and their professional careers. Yeah, and I mean, that's even true without kids, right? We all need to pursue a healthy balance between our personal and professional life. Yeah, well said. I want to go back to, uh, to, to echo something that uh, Dr. Nestle said. So I'm Reg Miller. I'm the Research Integrity Officer here for Mount Sinai. And um, on this issue of pressure, I'm just thinking about a case that I dealt with not too long ago with a young woman who was in a lab and she was constantly being berated and told that she just didn't add up, she shouldn't be in science. And under that relating pressure, she committed research misconduct. Um, and in the course of evaluating these cases, 
it's important to look at the underlying circumstances. But if you find yourself in a situation like that, back to what Eric said about no tolerance, let us know before you get pushed into that corner. And we will address it as a, as a team, as an institution. Thank you. Any other thoughts you guys want to share or questions for Eric that you want to ask? <laughs> oh, Danielle, I'll back there. Hi. Um, thank you, Denise. Um, so I think so, two things that came out in your talk was that um, the people you confronted were kind of and there was a major uh, power imbalance, right? So they pretty much throughout your career, there was a male, typically white, determining your future and you have to sit there and kind of behave. Uh, so to, I think to answer uh, Eric's question, that's one component of it, to address the, the power imbalance such that the people who are above you and determine your future are not always uh, uh, white males, basically. Uh, but the other thing that, that you showed is that Males, uh, a lot of friends, guy friends, stood by you and helped yeah, you. Um, and that's the, I think the second part of the um, way to address it is that um, males should take re some responsibility and active and act. Uh, because it, it's, it's pretty difficult. Uh, I mean, if there's imbalance and kind of this implicit bias in society, it's because it's a structured, um, structured problem. And it's a not a problem we women created, right? We just confront with it. And there are people in power or in more power that could address it. Uh, so there has to be something active. And uh, Eric, for example, had to send, or every now and then has to send an email encouraging the guys to, to join, right? And that's, that's really important to keep pushing that, to show that the norms are now different. And you, as, as, a, as a male, as a director, as the person in charge, are not going to tolerate it. Yeah. Uh, so these, I just wanted to highlight that these two components. Thanks, Daniela. Any other? Yes. <laughs> okay, um, but they can't hear you. No, of course, sorry. Mic. I kind of want to add to that point as well. It's really interesting. Of course, it's important to be brave and to be that person who speaks up. And it's you're right. We are surrounded by both men who will or will not listen, and we're really grateful to have somebody who certainly will and will act. But I think that both for men and women, women are often encouraged not to use their voice, like you were talking about. You, can, you can't be too pushy, you can't be too demure. You know, it's, it's a very hard balance to strike. So if somebody ever does come to you, whether it's a, man, a woman or a man, listen to their story. Don't assume that their experience is, you know, they're being too sensitive. That's the thing too, it's like, oh, maybe you're just being too sensitive. You know, he just is complimenting you. And it's like, well, actually, it made me uncomfortable though. So how about you give me the space just to say it out loud? And I think that's really important is hearing those voices. And, and I think women do it too, though. It's not just men not listening. Women are like, oh, but come on. Like, you know, being catcalled is normal. We all get catcalled. And you're like, oh, but I'd rather not. So. Yeah, but it shouldn't be normal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I unfortunately too have an, a, like an experience where something happened and I, I did speak up. I didn't speak up in a manner that would have an immediate repercussion, but something to address a situation internally. And um, I was told, you know, oh, this is cultural from where this person is from. This needs to be rectified. And essentially something, you know, internally occurred. Um, and I think when you go about doing these things, it's important to be brave and all of that. But how do you deal with the repercussions of that? Because you, you talked about how this might affect you with grant writing and X, Y, and Z. And I think from that experience, I unfortunately actually moving forward felt I will never do this again because this so significantly impacts. Oh, sorry. <laughs> one, two, one. Okay. I felt like it, it so significantly impacts my future career, especially because I'm not in a position of authority or power. Um, I'm like I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm not a, a doctor. I'm a female. I'm starting out in my career, and while I've published papers and I've you know worked really hard to get where I am. I'm actually terrified of how this will impact me. And it's overwhelmingly happening to women, and it's not discussed. And so when the women who are brave speak about it, they may be like reporting how it's happening, but then they're going to be, be viewed sort of as 
the women who are like, rah, 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 this is happening to me, and why is it overwhelmingly happening to you? As opposed to really reflecting, I think, the environment that we, that we work in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Eric, what do we do? Yeah, so. <laughs> I don't want to be accused of mansplaining. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, first of all, I'm so sorry to hear about that experience. You have to trust the leaders of the institution to protect you from recriminations. I totally understand the, uh, the factors that uh, are involved and the risk that you feel you are taking in stepping forward. You just have to trust us, and I know how that sounds. You have to trust us that we will do what is necessary to protect you. Any comments okay, so I to wanted that? to. I actually wanted to follow up on, on what this person was saying, as well as I can add something to that too. I think one of the problems of some of the abusive situations or the things that are even worse is that it's not just something that happens in a moment, it's something that goes on and it's something that can stifle careers because you can't be at a meeting with that person or you can't, you know, it, it really does constrict what can happen. And it, even with our trainees, um, I think we need to, to work on that culture of, of realizing that um, it's not just an isolated event. It's something that will curtail opportunities for a long time to come. And, and building on what this person said earlier also about it's men and women, I think the culture about whether it's just how we talk, the language we use, how we treat people, um, women as well, we've grown up in this culture. Things are gendered. Um, looking when you go to a student presentation or a postdoc presentation, looking at how people push back against the women is different than how they put push back against the men. And it's not something we even necessarily realize we're doing. And, and how do we strengthen and build up the strengths of people regardless of their gender and not reinforce these, these gendered ways that we act to keep some people down? You know, how do we train each other to talk? And if you, if you start paying attention to the language that's used when we are at thesis committee meetings or, or at other things, it, it can be quite telling. Um, and, and that's part of a larger issue because not every, not every woman is a victim, not every man is a predator. Um, there are plenty of very well-intentioned individuals who have no idea what they're doing. How do we discuss this in a way that doesn't make them defensive or ourselves defensive when we realize, oh, you said something and actually it had this effect? I think it's a much larger cultural issue and I, I don't know how we fix it. And if, if any of you well-meaning individuals have a way to tell me how to approach you when you've said something that I saw affect a student or that affected me that won't get you defensive but that will actually be productive, that would be amazing. Because yeah. I think there's a lot of really great people who don't realize the effect they're having. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Thank you so much to you guys for all of your comments. So we do have to um, give up the room. So first of all, I'm going to just say thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for being vulnerable with me. Um, and, you know, you guys, we have an army. Look around, right? So we're not going to solve all of our problems here. I don't even have answers for you. But maybe one thing that can be helpful um, is that I think conversations that we had is that we need help at all levels, right? We need to have great leadership that we can go to as Eric's counting his paper clips, that we can go, hey, Eric, this happened, and maybe you don't need to report it or something, but help me figure it out. And maybe you're not comfortable doing that, and I get it. But maybe there's a friend that you can go to, or there's um, you know, a faculty, another faculty member that you can tell, tell somebody. And then just don't look ahead, look behind you, because you are leading the way for a lot of people to follow. And the culture that we um, develop here, at, you know, in a very local institution, um, hopefully this can be the example um, of how we help other people and that we can um, be supportive to those that are you know, even more junior than us. And look behind and say, hey, do you need someone to talk to? Do you need some, uh, you know, a listening ear? Um, that's not gonna solve all the problems, for sure. But I think that the point of, I think, of this initiative is to begin the conversation. It's gonna be a long process. Change takes time. Change takes many voices, lots of support. And we are grateful to Eric and Sandy and the support of the leadership here. Um, and we will be coming to you as you count your paper clips, Eric. So thank you guys.